Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast, the industry's first and longest running podcast now in our 19th year. I'm your host, Jess Marquez, and our guest today is Rich Sullivan, CEO of Good Giant, to talk about the history and formation of the nationwide advertising powerhouse, its plans for 2024, and a few of Sullivan's favorite campaigns. Today's GGB podcast is sponsored by Pavilion Payments, which empowers gaming institutions to create an enhanced patron experience with a complete suite of integrated payment solutions that enable safe, secure, and trusted cash access at the cage, on the casino floor, or online. Learn more at pavilionpayments.com. If seven seasons of Mad Men didn't make it clear enough, brand power is everything, and few ad firms have had a bigger impact on the gaming industry than Good Giant, led by CEO Rich Sullivan. The result of a 2022 merger between Foundry and Red Square, Good Giant operates offices in Nevada, Oklahoma, Illinois, and Alabama, with a growing portfolio that spans from hard rock to Snickers. Sullivan spoke with GGB Managing Editor Jess Marquez via Zoom in January. Rich, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great. Happy to be here, Jess. So this is a bit of an interesting episode for us because we don't typically get to hear from this side of the gaming world. You know, we talk a lot about operators and suppliers and basically everything in between, but we don't often get to kind of the marketing and branding side, uh, which is what you at Good Giant are uh, most famous for. Um, so I kind of want to dive into that a little bit, but first, you know, I wanted to get started uh, with you personally. Uh, you know, I always like to start with the guests. So um Kind of, uh, you know, what brought you to this point? You know, uh, is your background always, uh, you know, did you have a, a start in gaming or kind of how did you, uh, you know, wander into the industry as it is now? I wandered into the industry yeah. as it is now. Um, I uh, <clears throat> did not have a background in gaming. Um, I uh, I also didn't have a background in advertising. So I've uh, been doing this for almost 25 years and uh, di didn't go to school for advertising. Uh, my father had an ad agency, so I grew up, uh, I grew up proximal to advertising. Um, and I was, I was somewhat aware of it. My father did a pretty good job of, um, of really not bringing it home. Uh, and it was before the internet. So it was kind of home life and work life were pretty, pretty separate. And, uh, I had no inclination of going into the into the advertising business whatsoever. Uh, went to Alabama uh, in Tuscaloosa and spent four years uh, prepping to go to medical school and um, got all the way through and was ready to do that and just had a an existential pivot. And um, so I I I called my parents and you know uh, and just said hey I'm not going I'm not going to medical school and they were both um, wonderful about it and of course the very next question is what are you going to do and and so I uh, I somehow like I, I don't know talked my way into a fifth year at Alabama and. Um, Really, it was just to buy myself a little bit of time to figure out what I wanted to do. And so I took I took some finance and accounting and and all of that. But I uh, I made a group of friends that have been lifelong friends. And we really uh, spent an inordinate amount of time uh, playing cards. And it was like right at the right at the moment where I was just the right age where uh, rounders had come out and the world series of poker was, um, was getting on ESPN and it was just kind of bubbling up in the, in the zeitgeist. And, um, we Tuscaloosa, Alabama is about an hour and 30 minutes, uh, to the East of a tribal casino in, uh, Mississippi. So, I really spent my fifth year at Alabama in a casino in Mississippi. And um, it was a wonderful time. I, I like, I think about it all the time. I, I, we, I've still got this tight group of friends that uh, would go over there together and we're all still good friends. And um, we still, we still occasionally play together. And, uh, but it was, it was that moment that, that I was exposed to the category and um so I finished that fifth year and wound up at my father's ad agency the next year, really just to kind of see if it was something I might be interested in. Uh, I didn't have any sort of idea that I would be, and I fell in love with advertising. So um, 
So that's how I that's how I got in the ad business. And after a few years of of working in the agency, I I started running it pretty quickly. It was a really small agency. Um, my father built a local uh, kind of Gulf Coast ad agency and had built a successful business. And my goal my goal was to build it into a national agency. And one of the ways that uh, that we thought to do that was through the gaming category. I, I, I kind of took those two things, the experience my fifth year at Alabama and the opportunity uh, that my father put in front of me with this agency to, to try and build a business. And so really happenstance, but just sort of following, following where things go. Well, that's fascinating. And, you know, I, I will say, having never been to Alabama, I must admit, I, I can't imagine that your, uh, you know, your story with your fifth year and everything is, is like, I can't imagine you're probably not the only one uh, to do that. Um, and I will say, you know, before we go on, uh, you know, my condolences to you, I'm sure, uh, you know, it was a tough game uh, on Monday, but uh, I'm sure you guys will be right back there uh, here pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And my fifth year, yeah, fifth, fifth years at, at the University of Alabama are um, are are typically uh, extra football season sort of victory laps. And uh, we were awful when I was in school. I, I like. I'm gonna say, yeah, it probably wasn't the glory of now. Yeah. Uh, I caught I caught like the my freshman year I caught the tail end of um, Gene Stallings, and then it was like rotating, revolving door kind of thing for until we you know, found saving later and just probably the finest hire the state of Alabama has ever made. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was a tough game Monday. Interesting. Interesting. So, you know, you mentioned you kind of, uh, you connected those two forms, you know, to kind of get into the gaming space. So like those first, when you were first kind of breaking into the space, so to speak, kind of what was that like and kind of, um, well, how did the development go, you know, to how did it rev up eventually to where we're at now, obviously where you guys have a heavy hand in that? Yeah, I, um, it was slow going to begin with. Um, so this is in the early, I got to the agency in 2000. Uh, we started, uh, pursuing the gaming category in, I mean, pretty, pretty closely after that. And, um, in the last 20, the last 23 or four years, um, the gaming category has obviously changed. Tremendous. Um, at the time, we f I, I liked it because I personally liked it. I, I I think it's I think it's easier to be uh, uh, to work in advertising um, when you're working on things you love. Um, of course, we've worked on all sorts of stuff, and um, the advertising business is typically most agencies are are jacks of all trade and masters of none, and you could get really interested in selling you know, a tire iron or something. And, um, but I really was attracted to the category because I liked it. It had, you know, I mean, in, there's so many different components uh, from an amenity standpoint. I like to play golf. I don't mind a nice hotel. I like a good steak. I like to play cards. Like what's, you know, I, I can probably speak the language. And um, so, uh, beyond that, it was just, I felt like it was a good opportunity because not a lot of agencies were focusing on it because they hadn't really had to. Uh, most uh, at the time, uh, as you know, tribal gaming has really only been around since, you know, early and mid nineties. So it hadn't really proliferated across the country and there wasn't a, um, there wasn't the saturation that you have in the marketplace at this point. And so it was a build it uh, to some degree, a build it and they will come uh, type of a, a market. Um, and so agencies weren't as valued and they also just weren't attracted to the work. Um, it was uh, the demographic was um, was skewed a little bit older and it was a you know sort of viewed as a schlocky schlocky category from an advertising standpoint and just wasn't where the action uh was so to speak and um but i thought that was a marker for opportunity and um so we're we're close in mobile alabama which is where where we're based we're proximal to um to biloxi mississippi so 45 minutes and and you're in a pretty good regional gaming market. And uh, so the first thing we did was we went over there and banged on every door we could. And 
Um, and everyone was receptive. Uh, we got meetings and, but it's like any other situation where you are a man without a portfolio. Um, you sort of show up and you're eager and they could tell we were eager to be in the space, but they were like, well, tell us what success you've had with other clients. And, you know, the answer is we've had none. Um, and so, um, they were like, well, great, come back when you've got something. And so, uh, the next place we, and we just sort of lucked into it, we called the, uh, Porch Band of Creek Indians in Atmore, Alabama, who were operating a, a, a gaming facility, but it was they hadn't been they hadn't built Wind Creek yet, and so they were still a very small player in a in a market that nobody thinks about. And they hired us, and that was almost I think that was about twenty years ago, and. Uh, so that really got us into the market. We did some we did some nice stuff with them, and we continue to work with Wind Creek today. So they're they're our, our first and longest uh, running client, and and uh, the Porch Creeks have, have built an incredible business with the Wind Creek brand uh, in the twenty years since. I mean, they're one of the they're one of the most innovative, uh, quickly growing operators in the country. And so that was a that was a we were in the right place at the right time. We did some nice work with them and then we got hired. We got hired over in Biloxi and then we got hired over in Oklahoma and then we got hired up in New England and it just sort of, we were off to the races at that point. Well, you know, it's interesting and, and it, it really, uh, you know, when you talk about it, it really kind of falls in line with what you hear, like the theme of a lot of successful businesses where it's like about filling a need and then growing alongside, you know, as that, as that need grows, you know. Absolutely. Um, and that kind of brings us, you know, in some ways to the present, or at least, you know, to the to the recent uh, past. And I was very interested uh, when I saw, I actually had just started in this job pretty much when I first saw you guys' announcement in 2022 uh, yeah. combined. It was a Red Square and Foundry combined to create Good Giant, which you guys are now. Yes. Uh, could you kind of talk us through, you know, uh, the, how that process came about and then kind of how it's gone in the, I think, what is it, about a year and a half, almost two years since? Yep. And also, just to, also as an aside, where where did the name Good Giant come from? Because that was all you know. Every time we, you know, we, you, thankfully, you know, you guys uh, work with us, and we, we, every time we put it into our our editorial schedule, I'm like Good Giant. I'm like, where did that even come from? You know what I mean? Like, so I'm I'm curious to hear. Well, I so I'll start with how we um, I'll start with how we got together with Foundry. So um, we had been there were two ways that we transformed our company into a national agency out of the Gulf Coast. And the the first uh, the first was really to focus on people and talent and doing really great advertising. Um, and the second was to find a category that we could we could own and and grow with, to your point. And gaming was that category. And and just to be clear we're not 100 percent gaming we've mm -hmm. we've we've dated that over the years we've uh we've gone back and forth and we've arrived at this idea that um having a heavy concentration to about 80 percent of our business in gaming and 20 in non-gaming is is really a magic formula for us um one it gives us the it gives us all of the benefit of category concentration uh from a growth standpoint um but it also gives us a little bit of variety and in, in a way to learn uh, from categories outside of the business, so we don't get tunnel vision. Um, so we're we're learning from other from other uh, best practices in different categories. Um, so that's how we that's how we that's really what we put in place in the early two thousands and into the two thousand and tens and. We were we were growing very nicely. Like it took us about between the time we got uh, working with the Porch Creek uh, group in Alabama, we uh, we spent about the next six or seven years sort of figuring out the business, and then in 2010 we just we took off. And so from 2010 until 2019, we had established clientele all over the place. We were doing some really great non-gaming work for big brands like Snickers and Twix. And so we had this great, this great portfolio mix and going into 2020, it was like, wow, this is going to be, this is going to be a, a really strong year. And, uh, and then of course, you know, early 2020 happened and it just changed 
everything. Um, I mean, just there's not a single thing that wasn't uh, up in the air, uh, particularly with with eighty percent of our our clients being in the in the casino business. And so in March, when when all the casinos shut down, um, I really didn't know another agency that was in the same exact situation as we we were uh other than uh my friend jim bowserman at foundry there's just not a lot of agencies that focus on gaming and have the same kind of composition and 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 um concentration in the business so i knew jimmy did and i had met jim at g2e a, a few years previous to the pandemic and uh we had been friendly and um he was one of the first phone calls I made. So in March, I, I pick up the phone. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? And he's like, man, I don't know. What are you doing? And uh, so we started talking and it was just a dialogue. And, um, and then uh, once everybody calmed down a little bit and uh, travel resumed and some properties started getting back open over the summertime, uh, I went out to see him and we just started talking about what would it look like if we went into business? And, um, and we toyed with it and we were like, well, you know, let's, it's, that could be cool. And let's maybe test the waters for a little bit first. And so I left, I left, uh, uh, Nevada and came back, uh, to Alabama and we, we kept up and then we started, uh, partnering on projects together, uh, over the course of, uh, 20, late 20 and into 21. And then we were like, you know, let's, let's give it a go. So, uh, that took us. It took us several months to to get it all orchestrated, uh, and then we finally got uh, got a merger completed in in middle of twenty two. So uh, just a ton of work that goes into that, and it's been a year and a half, and it's been a it's been a good year and a half. Um, there's a ton of learning that happens when you put two companies together. Um, I think that um, culture and we're a people business, so getting getting the 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 company put together in the right way just takes time and and you you can't force things you kind of have to let things uh take their own course and and make sure everybody understands the vision of the company so um the brand to answer the second part of your question so that's how we got together um really it was a it was a couple of a couple of agency CEOs getting together early in the pandemic talking about the future and uh, and we're optimistic about it, but we're also in the at the same in the same breath. We're like, if you know, if we put these companies together, just by nature of the size, that's going to be a stronger a stronger company, uh, just you know, strength in numbers kind of thing. And um, the name was we we really went back and forth on what to call the thing. Like everybody else who you know undertakes a business move, it's like. Well, what brand, you know, should we keep Red Square? Should we keep Foundry? And before we closed the deal, we had our management teams get together and and which is always kind of a touchy thing. And um to to introduce the the thought that we're gonna put the companies together. And we talked about the brand and um we kind of let it lay for a minute. And uh it, it became really apparent that one of the challenges when you put two companies together is that, you know, you have people that are Mainly from a cultural standpoint, there's there's different like idiosyncrasies and approaches. We nothing major, but um, things as simple as referring to how Red Square did something or how Foundry did something was something we wanted to be really conscious about because it is a new it is a new company and we're we, we're trying to build we're trying to build the best agency uh, in the gaming category. Period. It doesn't have to be the biggest. It doesn't have to be, we, we're not looking to have a certain number of people or a certain number of clients. We want to be the best. And and so the name for us was um, aspirational. Um, so we put a brief together and the the brief was um, the the bigger you get, the smaller you should act. That That whole idea that, we want to be a big company with all the resources of a large agency, like depth of talent, just sheer scale, um, because the gaming category from an advertising standpoint is really, really, really rigorous. 
Um, if you think about a if you think about a big resort property and all of the different programming and content that has to be dealt with on a daily basis and a monthly basis, it is hundreds of pieces of creative. So the it's just it's logistically uh, grueling, and um, so you have to have scale to do that in mass and to truly be able to deliver uh, great work. Uh, thousands of times to these clients day in and day out. And so this idea of building this big, wonderful company, that's kind of the, the giant side of the equation. But the good side of it is sort of the juxtaposition of we don't want to become this big, uh, you know, enormous company that that doesn't serve its clients the way that a small agency would uh, with the scrappiness and attention to detail and the service level. And also just like this idea that we're an underdog because we still feel like we're we're an underdog. Uh, we're coming out of really interesting markets, the Gulf Coast and you know uh, Northern Nevada and then Tulsa and you've got all these kind of secondary markets and we're trying to we're trying to build an agency that is really recognized nationally as being great and focused on this category so that's where the name comes from it's it's we want to be we want to have all this heft and we want to have all these resources but we want to have the attitude of a, of a tiny shop that has something to prove well that's fascinating and you know selfishly that's one of my favorite parts of doing these interviews like i said is i get to learn more about these things that i would have never known and I, I i think that makes a lot of sense and i think also now that i think about it you know i i always preface i always you know tell people they're probably tired of hearing about it but you know i i don't i can don't consider myself to be a very business oriented person or sales oriented person and so anytime somebody tells me a story like that regarding business and how like this transformation takes place i just have a lot of admiration for it because i just know I can't even begin to think of all the logistical, you know, from the biggest to the even the smallest, most minute things. And also, oh, yeah. too, you know, with a situation like this where, you know, it's not as if and I don't mean to make it sound like any merger is easy, but it's not as if, you know, your two resort companies coming together to be a resort company. You know, the, uh, the advertising space is really, um, you know, it's hard to create a brand. It's hard to create a style and, you know, especially to merge the two. And I will say that, you know, again, selfishly, I look at your guys' work and I'm really impressed by just the aesthetics of it. I mean, obviously, everybody has their own tastes and preferences, especially in advertising. But I just think your the your guys' look and feel is, is exceptionally modern, but also kind of harkens back to, I mean, almost like you said to your father, you know, with the, the old style ads with really clear, legible text, really clean uh, visuals and kind of things like that. And I, I really I really like it. Um, as you guys kind of move forward now and into 2024, what is your kind of outlook? What are your expectations, uh, you know, for the year ahead? Uh, first, I appreciate that. Um, and I can tell you that um, a lot of the stuff that we've done for our brand is inspired by a lot of the old school uh, 1980s uh, and uh, 70s and 80s uh, Chiat Day work. So a lot of the stuff like the, the stuff we run and and ggb and and uh all of that i i really appreciate the the that you you're picking up on that kind of that sort of old school approach with a modern twist um um that as far as 2024 we are uh we're extremely optimistic i think that um you know a big part of putting these companies together is just getting the right people in the right spots and making sure that everybody understands what the vision of the company is and where we're going, what we're trying to do and making sure the clients understand that and the clients understand all of the additional services that we offer because of the, um, because of the combination of these two companies and 18 months in, it feels like we are finally at, like clicked into gear and ready to go clobber the market. And which is really exciting. And I think um, so we're starting to see we're starting to see a pipeline develop. Um, we've been really pretty quiet um, other than um, staying consistent with you guys and, and in the category. We, we really haven't gotten uh, outbound yet with our marketing. And that's going to change in, in the first quarter of this year. So people are going to start hearing our name over and over and over Um and I'm going to start, uh, you know, we're going to start creating content. We've got a, a bunch of really smart people at this company that have a lot to share. And so we're going to start to do that. Um, beyond that, I think it's a, 
Um, our growth is our growth has really been um, alongside the category. So I think the category growth, as you know, has been uh, exceptional since 2020. And you know, it's it's like what are the prospects of continue that sort of continued um, blistering growth? And um, I I think that um, we're seeing uh, every single one of our clients uh, in some sort of capital expansion. Uh, they're either looking outside of their their backyard uh, for acquisitions. They're expanding their their land based properties. They're getting into different uh, digital aspects of gaming, whether that's you know social or, or iGaming. gaming. And certainly, sports has been uh, a crazy a crazy couple of years with growth there. Um, so we think the opportunities uh, for an, for an agency like us are are going to be plentiful. Um, our existing core business is going to grow, um, and we think the the new business opportunity is is going to be pretty strong. So it's our our focus is really making sure we've got the talent in place, and and that to me is is if we've got the right people and we're doing the right kind of work, and we're pushing the clients from a strategic and creative standpoint, the client the the growth of our company will will happen naturally, and um, so it's kind of focus on. Focus on our people and doing a, doing great work for our existing clients, and everything else seems to take care of itself after that. So, twenty four is going to be the year we uh, we we sort of hit the hit the pavement and see uh, uh, see what we can do as a you know, as an expanded company, which is exciting. Certainly, sir, and you know I will certainly be on the lookout for that. Um, I have one more for you, and I thank you again so much for taking the time. I want to get you out of here quickly on this one. But I love talking when I get the opportunity to talk with people who have uh, businesses that are outside of gaming, because obviously the majority of people I talk to are hyper focused on the industry. But there are a few exceptions, you know, payment companies, advertisers, uh, you know, so people who have outside interests. And I'm always fascinated, like, especially from an advertising sense, because, you know, you mentioned you guys have had some like really uh, awesome, you know, non gaming uh, additions and such. What's your favorite uh, non-gaming uh, kind of brand or company that you guys have gotten to work for with uh, so far? I know there's a couple candy ones. There's Twix and Snickers. Is there any others that really stick out as your mind as being exceptionally cool? Yeah, um, I'll I'll kind of I'll end the interview where we started. Um, we had an opportunity about six or seven years ago to do the first institutional brand campaign for the University of Alabama. Oh, awesome! Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and that's I, we've worked for brands all over the place, but uh, we did the we did the campaign uh, where legends are made. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, it's been uh, you know whether that campaign was great or whether the timing was great, uh, you could argue. But um, that campaign is one that I'm probably most proud of uh, outside of gaming because it the, because of the longevity. And I had a bunch of friends that went out to Pasadena this past week and um, to see our our uh, design uh, held up by, by people all over the country and, uh, you know, in the Rose Bowl and and to see that work live for almost a decade uh, and really become sort of part of the fabric of of the University of Alabama makes me really proud. And uh, so that's that's that'd be my favorite one I, I know i'm kind of giving you a homer answer there but uh but it is and um but that's what's great about advertising too and it, it's we love to see it in our gaming clients as well like we are the 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 more and more our clients understand that the power of a really good brand particularly in a crowded market and gaming is a very crowded market at this point brand really is going to be a differentiator for your success. Your winners and your losers are going to be separated by the ones that have the stronger brands. And that's how you make connections with your your players and your guests. And uh, so that's the type of work we like to do, the stuff that really changes businesses and becomes a part of, of the business itself. Because all of the all the tactics and the promos and all of that type of stuff are going to continue to evolve and change, but what really can start to accrue and build value for a company through advertising is is on the brand side of things. So, um, so anyway, we're excited about the prospect of of what we've got happening, and certainly appreciate you uh, taking interest and taking the time to to talk to us. 
Certainly. And I would certainly agree. And I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, shout out uh, one of my favorite professors from college, Professor Van Coor, who always, always preached the uh, value of branding. Uh, and that is obviously a great example of that um, with the University of Alabama. Um, Rich, I know you got uh, other stuff to do today, so I will uh, let you go. I know you're a busy man. I want to thank you again for taking the time. Uh, wish all the best to you and Good Giant. We at GGB will definitely have our eyes and ears uh, trained on what you guys got going on. A special shout out to uh, all the folks at the Reno office. I've uh, never been there, but I'm sure they're all great folks uh, if they're there. So, um, Rich, thanks again, and I hope you have a great one. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate everything you guys do for the industry. Awesome. Awesome. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Take care. How are you too, buddy? Thank you for joining us on the GGB podcast sponsored by Pavilion Payments. Pavilion Payments is the entertainment and gaming industry's biggest vertically integrated payment provider, offering solutions that create a simple, secure, and more effective way for patrons to wager and fund their play. Learn more about the full suite of gaming solutions available at pavilionpayments.com. To learn more about Rich, Good Giant, and all the important issues in gaming, subscribe at ggbmagazine.com. To stay current with the weekly news of the gaming industry, subscribe to ggbnews.com and use the coupon code ggb180 for a free subscription. Don't miss an episode of the GGB Podcast by subscribing on Amazon, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts today. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.